Okay, guys, it's just gone eight o'clock, so I think we'll we'll make a start. Um, evening, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kat McGregor, and on behalf of the Farm Advisory Service, I'd like to welcome you along to this um, WIA meeting on going to market. Um, what I want to do now, folks, is introduce you to our speakers tonight. Um, delighted to welcome along Vicky Warcup from Star uh, from Farmstock. Vicky is the Joint Operation Director there. Now I'm not going to go into too much about Farmstock because Vicky's presentation covers off um, who they are, what their purpose is, and she's also going to be touching on um, some marketing opportunities and tips. Um, from there, we're going to pass on to Kirsten Williams, which many of you well know. Kirsten's helped us out at various meetings. Um, and Kirsten's going to be talking about the management steps ahead of going to market and looking at things like growth rates, feeding and finishing systems. So lots to pack in tonight, folks. So what we're going to do is just pass over to Vicky to kick start. Um, so Malcolm, I think, is just going to pass you over. Um, I've got Malcolm McDonald on here. He's our tech support for tonight as well. So, Vicky, just hand it over to yourself. Hi, guys. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. So, as um, Kat was saying there, um, I work for Farmstock Scotland. Um, we're a farmers owned co op based in the south of Scotland at Selkirk. We operate throughout Scotland, mainly through the central belt and we do have clients right up, well, members right up into the north, but we are predominantly in the central to southern Scotland and into northern England. Farmstock is a federal co-op, um, so that means we are owned, well, we are, have seven member groups, co-ops, which make up Farmstock under the Farmstock umbrella. We've been trading for 22 years and um, going from strength to strength. It's mainly prime stock that we do, but um, we also do a lot of farm to farm sales as well. So yeah, as I said, um, we have the seven groups that make up farm stock and these are them. So we have Scott Country Lamb, Lothian Lamb and Beef, Ayrshire Country Lamb, Galloway Lamb, Caledonian Organics, Border Counties Prime Stock and Milk Suppliers Association. So um, each of these, member groups has roughly about 920 members between them. We also have 570 non-members. They are um, farmer producers who are trading as non-members for whatever reason they've chosen to do that. So we have around about 1500 producers within the farm stock database and of which about 30% of those are um, trading at any one time. As I said, we're based in Selkirk. The Farmstock team consists of our executive chairman, Ian Watson, um, two operations directors, myself and Johnny Williams. We then have six full-time salaried livestock procurement officers and four part-time fieldsmen, along with one full-time and two part-time office staff. Um, at the moment, obviously, we're not based in the office we've been working from home and um we do still have one person in the office um for safety reasons obviously um our farmer board is made up with two directors or up to two directors from each of the shareholding co-ops so the business is the um trading of sheep and cattle to abattoirs throughout the uk and the main objective is to maximize returns to producers through economies, economies of scale, negotiation power through volume, and by matching stock with abattoir demand on the day that they are marketed. Now, that is absolutely key. We have so many different outlets, um, 15 different abattoirs, and it can change overnight. One company may have one contract one minute and then it swaps another company may have it the next day so it's so important that we keep up to date with the market they have on the day and that we can match the stock with that demand so we will be out on farm actually drawing and deciding where we think that they will suit the best and that is why we can guarantee we can get the best prices for our producers so we also do store and breeding stock which are traded farm to farm um, this keeps down commission costs and third party commissions as well, haulage costs, 
And it's obviously just so much better for the stock to move farm to farm because they've got less stress and they're going to arrive at the next farm feeling happier. So welfare issues as well, it's, it's, it's great for that. So our purpose is to improve the long-term profitability of our farmer members. That is the number one. Um, we want to provide cost-effective livestock marketing and providing customers with consistent quality. That is, like I said before, absolutely key that we match the stock with the demand. They can trust that we will go out on their behalf and um, procure the stock for them. Um, they will phone us up the week before we tell us the jobs that they have coming up and um, then we can tell them how many we'll have and they can trust us to find them. Our future vision is to build a strong and influential farmer controlled business that is value, a valued player in our livestock sector. I think we're doing that. We're going from strength to strength every year, and we're now being involved in many, many groups. Um, and people are coming to us for advice, which is great. So the benefits of trading through farm stock: higher average prices than other routes to the market. So each year we do a um, comparison to the SQQ, and of um, September 2019 to April 2020, our farm stock averages were £4 and £6 ahead better than the standard quality price. Excuse me. Low commission rates. So we have capped um, group members at £1.60 per lamb and £20 per cattle beast. It is never more than that for one of our members. Average lamb commissions um, last year were less than 2%. As I said earlier, we've got a wide range of outlets with access to over 15 outlets. Um, so we can ensure that we give you the best marketing opportunities. Faster and easier movement of stock. Again, that just goes with the, the amount of outlets that we have available because um, if you've only got a couple of outlets, then there could be long waiting times during the busy period from August to November. Store and breeding stock, as I said, traded farm to farm, reduced haulage and low selling commission, buying and selling prices are known before the movement. I see that as a massive plus because there's no gamble. You know exactly what you're going to have banked before you, you know, you can commit to that or not. And um, we are happy to come on farm and help people sell them with the, with the buyer there. And you can say yes or no to the price, which I think is just you know, where else can you do that? Full for fieldsman services, as I said before, we will go and farm, um, draw stock, and we'll also provide you with marketing advice while we're there. If we think the stock are better um, staying on the farm for another month to reach their full potential, we'll tell you that and how to achieve it. Fast guaranteed payment, well, payment in seven days direct into your bank account and it's 100% guaranteed. We have all our major companies that we deal with, abattoirs um, covered with credit insurance, so um, there's never any risk of losing your money. We have full transparent reporting, completely transparent returns with benchmarking showing all the weights and deductions. So um, if you were to sell fat stock through us, we provide um, the full report from the abattoir along with health reports if there's any issues with the offal or anything like that, worm burdens, fluke, that kind of thing. So that helps with your management decisions. And we are building a farmer owned business for the future. So it's our farmer's business, which is, yeah, I think that's absolutely great. And that's what we want to push forward is for our members. So going on to marketing opportunities and tips. So keep up to date with current prices and trends. This allows you to make informed decisions on when it's best to um, market your lambs. The best way to decide how and when you're aiming to sell your lambs. So if you, um, for instance, know what the trends are doing, you know that the price will go down in October, then you're going to try and have 
most of your lambs are way before that or you can aim for Christmas or you can aim for Easter. If you can keep your eye on the trends of what prices do, then you can have something to aim towards and you, that'll help you with your management decisions as well. Deciding whether you're gonna sell them fat or store, that's another, another question to ask yourself. Depending on when you're planning on marketing your lambs, there's certain times of the year when they're better sold as stores and other times when they're better sold as fat. It all depends on the system that you have and that's what farm stock can help you do. We can come on board, have a look at your stock and help you decide whether, have a look at your grass that you have left or your feeding system if we think that they will be better for fat or store. So it's definitely worth thinking of both options. Um, uniformity. When you're selling sheep, you really need to have them batched into uniform groups. It makes a huge difference when you're selling them. If you can weigh the lambs if possible, if you can't, try and put them um, in groups that they look similar size wise. If you had a group of 100 lambs, you could split them three ways, um, a middle batch, a top batch. Your top batch might be good enough to go fat. Um, your middle batch might be great to go store and then your smaller ones, you might think I'll run those on for another month and put some more weight into them. And taking those, uh, the big little lambs away from the field would then allow those smaller ones to really thrive on because they would have all that extra grass. When selling fat lambs, then physically grading them is so important as well actually handling the lamb, as I said before, weighing them if you have the facilities, if you don't, just handling the lambs is so important. And if you're unsure to do this, then please ask for advice. Um, I know many abattoirs are happy to do live to dead days, which are great. I've done so many of them and we've taken all our young staff, um, trainee staff on them. And the difference from when they've gone in, what you actually do is you select the lambs and decide where you, how you think they'll grade. You follow them through the process and then um, you'll see how you do. And actually seeing them out of their skins is just, it really does help you understand the whole carcass and what you're feeling for when you're feeling them with the wool on. Another thing um, we've found obviously with COVID, um, it's been very difficult for people. We've been a bit restricted of what we can go and see. So we found that uh, photography has been absolutely a fantastic way of selling stock. Um, but you have to be quite particular on how you're photographing them or videoing them. It's so important to get good lighting and show the full range of the lambs because, or cattle, whichever it may be. Because if 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 you can't if you can't see exactly what you're buying, people will just discard them. So, um, have a few examples to show you at the end of um, good and bad pictures. We've also got um, a video on our Facebook page on our farm stock Facebook page, which talks you through a good video. Um, I'm sure many of your whizzes with technology but um, just if you might want some tips it isn't on sheep but it's on cattle so um, if you wanted to have a look at that then please take a look so here we have the current europe grading system now this is what all the abattoirs in the uk are currently using so um e being the best p being the worst um, this, these pictures actually just show you the confirmation. It doesn't show you the fat grade because that's actually quite difficult to show on pictures. But you can clearly see here the difference between the, the confirmation grades, especially when you're looking at the jigget of the lamp. So the area around the rump. Um, and also you can see slightly on the shoulders as well, just the covering. You can see the redness of the one of the P and then the fantastic cover of the E grade. So it's basically um, for anyone that is um, not familiar with the Europe grading system, um, base prices that you're given at the abattoir are always based on an R2 or an R3L. And um, for an O and a P you would expect deductions. 
from that price per kilo. And for a U and an E, you would expect a premium because they're getting such good confirmation. And these lambs can be sent um, on really good export jobs for more money per kilo. Um, so again, this is what this is how you would see them hanging up if you did do a live to dead day. Um, and and you would they would actually physically show you exactly where you would feel them and it would really really help if anyone's interested then please please get in touch as i said to you i would show you some um good and bad examples of sheep photography of sh trying to sell batches of sheep so here on the left you can see these group of blackies you can actually only see three full-bodied sheep there um, and it's quite poor lighting. There's no um, scale. There's no you can't you can't decide how big they are. There's nothing to compare them to. And again, on the right there, I think you can actually only see two full-bodied sheep or three as well, maybe. But it's just you really need um, a better comparison of of the whole lot. Here are some good examples. Now, you might think, oh, they're quite far away. We can't see them that well. But actually, these are great because we can zoom in on these and um, it shows you there's probably 200 lambs in each of these pictures. And you can see the uniformity. They've made a really good effort to make them a really good uniform group. And both of those batches of lambs were sold within a day. Um, so if you can take pictures like this, that's absolutely what we're looking for. And it makes such a big difference. Also, try and take them on a nice day <laughs> and on some nice grass. It's amazing what makes things sell. Um, so I hope that um, that's been of uh, use to you all. And please ask any questions at the end. Thank you very much. Vicky, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have a couple of questions which will hang on to the, the Q&A session at the end. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll just pass on to Kirsten, I think. Malcolm will just transfer us over to Kirsten um, and we'll come back at the end. Thank you, Vicky. No problem. OK, thank you, Kat. Um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about um, market and management. So we've heard for sort of direct farm to farm. Um, so we're, we'll go for the market. But first, I just want to ask a question through the polls. So this is what Kat spoke about earlier. So we'll just launch the poll and it's just to get a feeling of how you currently sell your lambs. So is it store? Is it prime, which is fat? A mixture of both or if you don't currently have sheep? And it just gives us a bit of a feeling of um, what everybody's at. So stores, obviously, when they're when they're sold before they're fat, um, they're fat, a mixture of both or if you don't currently have sheep. Okay, so we've got um, the results in for the poll, and we've got 43% um, a mixture of both, 25% prime, 21% store, and 11% I don't have any sheep. So we're talking to all all types of crowd, um, which which is good for my presentation because I covered everything. Um, so that's that's really good to know. So just to sort of start off with, I thought, given that it's a Caithness group, I thought it would be mostly um, selling stores. Um, obviously, the poll's telling me very differently, but so I've just kind of made the, the slide on when it's best to sell store. So basically, if there's any of these, then it's, it's possibly better to sell store. So it's thinking about, you know, if you've got land, enough land, if you've got breeding yows as well, Thinking about this time of year, the lambs are weaned, the yows are starting to think about the next breeding season, trying to get condition back onto them, trying to get them ready for the tup. Also then when they're tupping, keeping them in a nice plane of nutrition as well. So if you've got loads of loads of grass, loads of land, then probably not a problem. But if you are tight, then the breeding stock should really be prioritised, thinking of next year's lamb crop. Similar, what fodder resources um, there is, you know, so if, if you've got some like forage crops or swedes or something, you know, what, how is it yielding? Have you, have you grown it and it's not actually yielded very well? Did the flea beetle come and eat half of it? You know, so it's, it's just thinking about what grass and forage you've got available. Then also 
how expensive it is to get alternative feeds. So if you're buying in concentrate, buying in barley, how expensive is that compared to the difference of selling finished or store? Building space comes into it as well. You know, if you're short of grass, if you're short of forage, and you think, well, I can house them, then think about what building space is actually available. And also what labour, because, you know, when you start to house them or if you've got more sheep in the place, then obviously it does encounter more labour as well. So that's just a, a few things to think about between selling store or selling finish. So as I said, I'm going to try and kind of focus more on the marketplace rather than um, direct farm to farm, since Vicky's covered that already. Um, so it's it's basically getting ready for the sales, keep an eye on the store land prices. Vicky has said just that, but at the same point, keep an eye on your feed supply as well. So if you think, oh, it's going to rise in two, three weeks, I'll keep a hold of them. But if you don't have the forage there to keep them for two or three weeks, you know, are you actually going to sell them for a lesser amount of money? So it's, it sort of goes hand in hand, the price and your feed supply. You're also trying to think how you can attract the buyers. And really, you know, the buyers are what helps you get a good price. And I've got a, a funny looking slide there. And it's actually um, my husband and some of his friends. And they were invited along to do a lamb um, trimming day at a kind of educational day for, for members of the public. They were asked to, to dress a bell texture lamb. So they were to show how, you know, you, you make it that look nice and wide, how you make its jigget look as good as possible, its um, top line. And they just thought they would have a bit of fun since it was full of public and um, trimmed it into a poodle, which I think they did a very good job of trimming it into a poodle. But it's just kind of showing, like, try and, try and catch people's eyes, but maybe not just quite go as, as far as this. But do make them look their best, you know, do trim dirty back ends, trim bellies, depending on how many you've got, wash heads, wash legs, you know, just try and make them as attractive as possible for your buyers. And again, Vicky's spoken about social media and, you know, it's, it's such a good way to, to let people see what you've got before the sale day. But just watch out for any blunders. You know, if you've got, if you're taking a video and say there's 10 sheep in the video and there's two that are lame, you know, just think what perception that's going to make for the people looking at the video. The same with silly things like ear tags, you know, make sure that they're compliant with legislation as well. Um, and, you know, if you're putting up a post, tag your local market, get your local market to share it for you. I've done um, one just here that was a sale on Monday there up in Cape Ness. And it's just, you know, people have sent it into the local market and they've shared it and it just helps get extra views as well. Thinking as well, how do you make yourself stand out from the crowd? So when you're doing your social media posts, if they've been dipped, if there's you know, if they're in the enzootics scheme, if they're tick acclimatised, anything that's just going to make them more sellable is well worth mentioning. And social media is free. You know, there's, there's no cost to posting stuff up on social media. Also, market day, just thinking of the, the legalities of it, just make sure the right tags are in the right animals and the right paperwork. So you put your slaughter tag up in the top there. So it's just basically your UK number with no sequential number. So that goes into any lambs that are under 12 months old and haven't moved from their holding of birth before sale. Or you've got your double electronic on the right hand side there. And that's for anything that's over 12 months breeding. So if it's store lambs you're selling and they've never moved off the holding of birth, then your slaughter tag is fine. But if it's lambs um, or if it's gimmers, say, then obviously then that is double tags. And just remember, they need to be electronic and they need to be accompanied with a movement document as well. On the day of the sale, try and arrive in plenty of time. You usually get to see the catalogue beforehand, so you can have a look online. You can usually work out what kind of time you'll be sold. So if you've worked out, you're selling at 11 o'clock, don't turn up at 5 to 11. The yard staff actually have to pen your animals. The office has to process paperwork. Um, and you don't want to miss your place in the catalogue because if you do, then you're usually put to the end of the sale. So make sure you arrive in plenty of time. Also, the auctioneer will try and get a hold of you just to ask if you've got a reserve, if you've got a minimum price on your stock. So again, you want to be there early on so that the auctioneer can have that discussion with you. Once you've sold, you can go and collect your cheque, your sales receipt. And just to bear in mind, there's some deductions there. So you'll have commission, which will vary depending on the mart, the sale. 
You've also got other deductions and insurance levy, and then there's VAT on those deductions, so your commission, insurance, and levy. You might also have belly clipping of lambs if you're selling um, fat lambs through the market. If you're the buyer, just a few things to think about as well. Um, I'm not going to read them all out to you, but the one at the bottom, quarantine and arrival, is so, so important. That is making sure that you're not mixing them straight away with other stock. You don't know what you've bought in. You don't know if there's a underlying foot problem. You don't know if there's a resistance to worms. You know, you don't know what's going on inside of the animals. So quarantine them, speak to your vets, find out what products are the best, what suits for your farm. But the quarantine is, is something that just not a lot of people do, but it's so, so vital for the, the health of both your, your stock that's on the farm and for your profitability as well. So the, the quarantine is a, a major bit to, to make sure happens. So I've rattled through that quite quickly. I'm aware that Vicky covered uh, quite a lot of those parts as well. So if there is anything that I've gone too fast over, you've got your question tab over on the right hand side. So just put in any questions that you've, you've got into there and we can get to them at the end. I'm just going to speak a bit about the growth rates now. Um, and just trying to think back to you keep sheep, it's a business, you really, you know, you're, you're in it for profitability and it's getting the maximum economic returns. And the way to, to I like this quote, is um, plan your production to meet the requirements of the market. So if you're just plodding away, letting the gra lambs grow as, as they like, not really monitoring it, you don't actually know what's happening with your production. And like Vicky's spoken about the market, when there's highs, when there's lows. And if you're just letting them plod away, you don't actually know that you're meeting when the, the biggest kind of area of the market is, or if you're going to hit the market requirements. So growth rate comes in and monitoring your growth rate um, is a massive, massive thing for, for lambs. And I've just got here a massive heap of um, why growth rate. So you want to check your targets, you know, set yourself some targets. It's, it's great to have goals and to see where you're going. And always, always strive to, 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 to get them to, to go better. You know, don't set a target that's unreachable, but set something that's actually moving on the performance of your, your flock or your lambs. And we're looking at reducing costs as well. So we're, we're looking at efficiency here. So the, the quicker they're growing, the more efficient they are. And the more efficient they are, the less waste there is in the system. And the waste often causes costs in the long run. You've got your marketing returns, so it lets you estimate your days to slaughter, it lets you think about your cash flow, it lets you know when your lambs could potentially be sold and have those discussions with your avatar, with your auctioneer, with um, your local salesperson. It also gives you a real base to make sound decisions. You know, you've got actual data that you can then make decisions on when to do things. You've also got forage availability. So we spoke about that at the start. So think about your other stock. Have you got breeding sheep? Have you got cattle? What, what forage is required otherwise in the farm? A great thing about it is you get really good feedback in your system. So if you've changed something, it very quickly lets you see if you've done it, if, if it's a positive change or a negative change. It might be something like nutrition. You know, you've, you've moved field or you've started rotational grazing or you've introduced hoppers. And it just lets you see if you're weighing them every, say, two weeks, then you can see if that's having a positive or negative effect and if they're working. You can also have a look at just if you've got two different breeds, is one performing better than the other? You can have a look at different tops. You know, it gives you a massive amount of data that you can then analyse about your system. So it's a really, really powerful tool just to monitor that growth rate. And here we've got stuff that affects the growth rate. So there's loads of stuff. There's, there's from the very start. So if they own your own lambs, then the mother and young nutrition you can look into. If they're bought in lambs, then you you can think about parasite burdens, general health. You've got the stress. You've got feeding systems, and it can be as much as what you're feeding them. It can be is there enough trough space. It can be have they got enough water availability. You know, there's so many different things in there. But at the end of it, it's monitoring that growth rate and then acting on what the findings are. So here we've got three different type of categories of lambs. 
and um, this this kind of helps think about when each one would be what each one's target would be I suppose so you've got your your short keep lambs that are your over 35 kilo lambs and then your long keep lambs which are your below 30 kilos so quite often your long keep lambs will maybe be lambs that have had a problem you know maybe it's been triplets or somebody who's been lacking colostrum it might be some of your natives and then you've got your short keep lambs that you're looking at they're only on the farm for about six weeks so if you can kind of batch up these different lambs to see which new, which lambs get which nutrition and which ones need the priority over others. And then we've got food conversion. So that plays a big part of it as well to when thinking about efficiency, thinking about reducing waste, to when to actually finish these lambs. So your feed conversion is basically a kind of measure of how much food the animal consumes and how much body weight they gain from there. So I've got a kind of graph there that shows chickens, pigs and beef cattle. So you can see there that, that chickens are about 1.82 to 1. So that means that they're the most efficient out of all those animals and they're basically eating 1.82 kilos of feed and they're gaining one kilo of body weight. So they're the most efficient. Then you've got pigs and then you can see beef cattle are further away. So your, your chicken and pigs, your intensive animals, kind of put our ruminants to shame a bit there. But you can also see down in the bottom there, I've got lambs, and up to weaning is when they're most efficient. So that's when they're going about four to one. That's when they're on mother's milk. They are When they're starting to eat the grass, it's at its best time of year for having high energy. It's good protein. And then when they're weaned, getting to this time of year, grass starts to tail off. It's, it's not as good nutrition. The more they eat, you know, it's they have to have more more mouthfuls of grass to get the same amount of energy and protein into them. So just now, this kind of time of year, they're travelling somewhere between four to one and eight to one. But as the year progresses, they'll end up being about twelve to one. So they're a lot more efficient the younger that they are. So when I had that kind of table or uh, three sheep up earlier, and you had your short keep compared to your long keep. You know, your short keep are the ones that are going to be the more efficient compared to the long keep ones. Thinking of different finishing systems, so we've got outdoor finishing systems and indoor finishing systems, and I've just listed quite quite a few different types of systems in there, um, and I'll just kind of go through a few of them. So we've got a massive amount of information on this table, and I'll, I know I appreciate it's, it's a lot of stuff to look into here, but this is just looking at your kind of different crops that you can finish on. Um, there's pros and there's cons, and this is a really good resource that's been made by HDB. They've got a really good lamb finishing booklet that's, that's well worth looking up. And here I've just highlighted two, just to kind of pinpoint two, but um, you've got your, your pros and cons. So there we've got chicory, plantain and clover. So this is finishing lambs on a crop that's high protein. They've got a really deep tap root. So they're getting right in about the soil. They're pulling up the trace elements and minerals from the ground. And um, they've also got a kind of anthelmintic property. So let's see your chic chicory, because it's quite an erect plant, it actually prevents the larvae the L3 larvae, we call it, of the worm, from being able to climb too far up the plant. And you don't tend to graze chicory too too low. You like to, you leave a good residual with it. So the lambs are never really eating right, you know, where the worms would be. So it's got its anthelmintic properties. On the cons, you've got it can be susceptible to crown damage. Um, it's got to be rotationally grazed. So that's what I'm saying. You leave a, a good residual. And if it gets away, then it's difficult to ensile. So it's it's got fantastic pros there, but it's thinking about the cons as well. And quite a lot of people with long keep lambs would put them onto Swedes, onto neeps. They're fantastic crops. They're frost hardy. They can be lifted. So if you end up that you've got some left, they can be lifted. They can be stored and fed to yows at lambing. They're also quite um, they're they're great for a break crop. You know, if you've got um, new grass to go in. It's a, a great way just to, to get a deep tap um, root in there for a year to break up the ground. But again, thinking of the, the other side of it as well, you need to have run back. You've got the potential of having dirty lambs if you get a really back, a really wet back end. 
and um, there's not much of a run back or the run back gets dirty you know you can have dirty bellies in your lambs and um, it's the environmental side of it as well you know you, you need to have a clean supply of water uh, but you don't want to be poaching at that water as well your performance can drop a bit when the lambs lose, the, lose their milk teeth so there's again you know for each different crop each different system there's fantastic pros but it's thinking about the cons and not not everybody is going to have the same cons so think about just like where exactly you are what your farm can cope with what breeds you're working with as well because that'll have a, a big difference in it as well so as i say a massive amount to look at there i appreciate there's a huge amount in that slide um, but the resource is uh, HDB booklet that you can find if you if you Google search it. So I've just got a, another poll here we're going to launch. Um, so it's which feed do you think would have the potential to reach the highest daily live weight gain? So we've just ha um, pointed out a few of these crops. So would you get the highest daily live weight gain from grass, aftermath or reseed, forage rape or red clover? So this would be for lambs from now. So it's weaned lambs that would be for finishing. Um, so I think that is pretty much it. So we actually have a bit of everything. So we've got 52% of people saying red clover. We've got 22% saying grass, 15% saying aftermath or reseed, and 11% saying forage rape. So the next slide I've got is going to show you a table and you'll see that they were actually in order of um, grass being the least and then red clover being the highest. So 52% of you um, got red clover. So this is just really showing target growth rates. And this this is just a, a, an industry kind of table, but bearing in mind there's different breeds. So if you've got a Texel lamb compared to a Shetland lamb, it's obviously going to be very, very different. So don't don't take this target as this is absolutely what you've got to be reaching. You know, think of your environment, think of your breed, think of your farm. But you'll see again, like I said about their feed conversion, that earlier on in life is when they're they're most efficient. So you can see there, up to eight weeks, the first six weeks, the majority of the diet is milk. After that, they start to eat grass, and that's when they're most efficient. They gain about 320 grams a day. After that, they've got more grass in the diet and less milk, so they start to tail off. After weaning, then there's a whole host of different things that can be fed, as we've just shown in that previous table. And there you've got your kind of targets. So your red clover is really high in protein. So that really helps make them grow. So you need your protein for growth and for putting down fat cover as well. So, so your red clover is the highest. That's for post weaning or finishing in the summer and autumn. So that would be like your short keep lambs in that first bit. And then the bottom part is winter finishing following a store period. So that would be more for your short keep lambs. And then this is looking at your, your forage crops, your Swedes, your fodder beet. And then you've got lamb finishing pellets there as well. So your lamb finishing pellets might come in if they're on Swedes fodder beet, but it might also be if they're on grass. And then there's, there's pellets in there as well. So that, that just gives you a kind of stab or a first kind of look of what what kind of the average is so that you can use this as a bit of a measure and if you keep a monitor of your own lambs you can kind of see where they're growing at just now and then where where you might be able to to kind of reduce waste or increase efficiency i spoke there about you know putting in some concentrate feeding and concentrate feeding has to be done nice and slowly uh, we don't want to have any sort of effects to the rumen and if we have effects to the rumen then sometimes that can either give you something like acidosis it can result in um, just you know immediate deaths it can it can really affect so we just try to introduce new feeds really quite um, slowly but surely and this this is actually showing you a kind of transition from milk so I've, I've said here prevent a weaning check but it's, it's the same for if they're weaned and you're introducing grain as well but this is just kind of showing the inside of a rumen for milk only first so that's when their baby's on their mums milk and hay and then milk and grain and you see the difference that there is in the stomach there so introducing it nice and slowly starting off feeding them at the trough 
and then moving them onto the, the hoppers just so that you're not affecting the pH of the rumen or affecting, you know, the you start to affect the pH, you affect the bugs, and then you affect how, how um, your fermentation and your rumination goes in your rumen. So while we're talking about um, feeds, you can buy a whole host of different feeds in the market. Speak to your feed reps, see what there is. There's a varying energy, there's varying protein. Your labels for your feed will always tell you what the protein content is, but they don't always tell you what the energy content is. So that's well worth asking. A really good way is just getting a hold of the label and having a look at what the ingredients are. And a rule of thumb is basically whatever the first three ingredients are should be high energy sources. So that would be like barley, wheat, oats, you know, stuff or maize, anything that's high in energy. If they're the top three ingredients, then it's generally a good feed. You can get them in loads of different ways. Uh, you can have blends, coarse mix, pellets. And you can see here just in the picture, there's, there's a, a nice looking coarse mix and a really dusty looking coarse mix. So there's nothing to stop you asking to see the feed before you buy the feed as well and just see what it looks like. Um, pellets, sometimes they can be selective of pellets. Coarse mix can sometimes um, can sometimes mean that if they, they leave something out, they eat the sweeties first and then they eat something. So everything's got its, its pros and cons. So it's, it's what suits you. But just try and avoid the dusty mixes because then that can lead to respiratory issues. Getting towards the end now and indoor finishing. So that's when you're looking at providing them silage, hay, along with concentrate. Build the concentrate up slowly. So start at about 250 grams per head per day, which is a very small amount of feed. But then slowly but surely work up to one to one and a half kilos. You've actually got the option to shear lambs when they're housed. You get a higher feed conversion. They eat about 20% more, so you get a higher conversion. They finish quicker. Um, and they don't need as much space, so you can have more animals. It also lets you get them off the grass, so it just lets your pasture recover or be able to give it to, to the priority stock. But you do carry the possibility of having a penalty when you sell it to the abattoir because your skin obviously doesn't have the fleece on it, so that, that can lead to penalty there. Think about your costs. So we've spoken about a range of different enterprises or ways to kind of manage the enterprise with different crops. If you're thinking of doing anything, keep thinking you're looking for an economic return. So running a partial budget is a great way. So you might just do it sort or finish, or you might do it concentrate against NEEPS. You know, it's, it, it's just a really nice tool that you can kind of assess what your additional income, your lost income, any cost saved and additional costs and see what the difference is. And there's a really nice tool available on the FAST website that is a template ready for you to do it. And if you just go into the FAST website in the search engine, type in partial budget and it will come up with it. Another thing to think about is just the sensitivity. So what if you've budgeted, but the market reduces by five pence a kilo? What if you've got 6% mortality instead of 3% mortality? What if feed price increases by 5% in the year? You know, just think of that kind of sensitivity when you're building in your costs. And finally, just some take home messages. Um, think about efficiency and remember that that's, that's a way to kind of think about reducing waste or cutting out where the waste is. The efficiency drops as the animal ages. Try and set some, yourself some growth targets and set them so they're achievable. You know, don't don't just stick with what I've put up on the screen. Think what is actually achievable for, for you and your system. Use regular weigh-ins. Like it's so important just to, to keep on top of them and see where they are and build sensitivity into your costings. Now hands back. Kirsten. Yep, thank you very much for that, Kirsten. Um, Okay, so um, I'm just going to check in with Kathleen. Kathleen, just... Sorry, sorry. So yep. on the sorry. unmuting there. Yeah, no, sorry. that's okay. Yep. Um, so folks, we've moved on to the Q&A part of this evening um, following ladies' presentations. I hope you found them very interesting. I, I certainly did. Um, Kathleen, what do we have in the way of questions that has come in? 
Yeah, we've got quite a few questions, both for Vicky and Kirsten. So oh, I'll girls. start with Vicky. Um, does does farm stock trade in all breeds of cattle and sheep, or does it depend? No, we will trade absolutely anything around. Uh, we've had many different strange breeds. Um, we do Wagyu recently. We've had Wagyu cattle. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're up for giving anything a go. So if you had anything weird and wonderful, please get in touch. Okay. Um, following on from that, um, do farm stock, do they supply the larger slaughterhouses, processors, or do you supply the local small slaughterhouses as well? We supply mainly the larger ones just due to the volume that we're handling. Um, and also due to the credit insurance, um, it's often quite difficult to get credit insurance on some of the smaller ones. We we have done a few butchers and um, small time abattoirs in the past, but it's really small numbers. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, do you find, Vicky again, do you find the store prices are quite reflective of the mark prices at the time of the sale or because it's a direct farm to farm sale, eh, the seller can command a premium? Um, it's very much in line. I mean, the, our, everyone, the buyers all keep in check with what's happening in the markets and actually the markets are very important and do set a price. Um, so although I, I do see major benefits in trading farm to farm, there's also the benefits of um, the markets as well. So um, yeah, there's I wouldn't say the premium unless there's a health, a high health um, breed or something. You know, they may have MV accredited sheep, um, and that person has MV accredited sheep at home, so they want to keep them really healthy. That can demand a premium, but if they're if, if it's just standard store lamps, then um, no, it's very much in line with the market at the time. And is there a minimum size, flock size that farm stock you're willing to take? Or, well, I don't suppose it'll be flock size, it'll be um, progeny um, selling wise. Will you take one or does it have to be a minimum or does it just maybe depend on where they are in relation to other sellers? Yes, it does depend where they are. Um, logistics can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, we do organise all the haulage for our members. So sometimes um, we have quite a lot of people actually will take their lambs in a trailer to meet a wagon. Um, so that is, yeah, I mean, we do have people that will meet the wagon with one or two sheep. So it's definitely not unheard of. But at the end of the day, it does all come down to logistics and where the wagons are at the time. But we'll do our very best to accommodate everybody. Um, Kirsten, uh, one for you. Um, you mentioned that uh, lambs could be selective when eating pellets. Could you maybe explain a wee bit more about that? Um, I, I hope I say can't be selective. Um, I'm sure that will have said that on the slide. Um, yeah, so you tend to not have the same selectivity on pellets because they're they're compounded down and every one is the same. Whereas your your blend or your your mix, like we had in the picture there, you've got loads of different types. So that's where sometimes they could pick out some of the the nice elements. Say they might want to eat the peas and yeah. maize um, and leave, leave the, ne the less nice um, ingredients. Sometimes you'll have some things in there like rapeseed meal say that can sometimes be a bit sour. So that one, yeah, they can just be sometimes a bit selective, but it depends how, how they're being fed, the feeding system. So if you're feeding them in the trough, they'll tend to, to eat it up quite quick. So they'll eat everything that's there. If it's in the hopper, it's quite difficult for them to be selective because what, what comes out comes out. You've got stuff like your three in one feeders, you know, where they've they've got to lick to get the saliva to to get them to to get the feed. Um so it really depends on the feeding system to to when when you allow them to be selective or not. But um pellets, it makes it very difficult for them to be selective on pellets. And um Kirsten again, um when is the best time to win lambs? Or is that maybe reflective in your system um, and your land type 
your grazing avail availability. Yeah, so you you um, look at a number of different things. So you need to look at your forage availability. You need to look at the condition of the yow as well. So if the yow is, is quite lean, then it kind of gives you an indication that she's she's struggling or she needs better grass or she needs less competition. You also need to look at the performance of the lamb because, again, you know, the, the lamb is starting to eat grass. So the, the mother and the lamb are starting to compete against each other for the best of grass. There's been a lot of trial work done about it and lambs tend to, to have the, the majority of their diet is milk up until about six weeks and then they, they tail off and they tail off quite sharply to be honest once they get onto grass they, 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 they do go onto the grass quite well and by 12 weeks the amount of milk they're taking from their mother is very very marginal and by 12 weeks the, the, the most of it is actually company you know the, the mother and, and the lamb kind of bond comfort um, so yeah but uh, on the other side if the yow is really fit you know there's there's nothing to to stop keeping them on for a bit longer to try and help manage her condition and the last couple of lambings there's actually been quite a lot of people reporting that they've they've got really fit yows and it's trying to think of that condition score all through the year and not just thinking of it as as when to wean you know it's it's thinking if, if they're a bit fat now right let's keep the lambs on them let's keep them sharper or if if the if the yows are quite fit but the lambs aren't thriving like you thought they would then the lambs can be taken off they can be put onto better grazing you know the, the best prioritize them with the best of grass that, that you've got and then put the yows in something that's that's really quite poor just to to um both dry them off and to try and slim them down a little bit so it's it's a great tool to be honest weaning it's um so 12 weeks is kind of when when they don't have the same amount of milk or a very little amount of milk but use it as a management tool to kind of reset the balance or help get your condition right. Um, sorry, there's just a few here. Uh, are you better to follow the flock with breeds or go different? Um, Kirsten, what do you think? Are you better to do what your neighbour's doing over the fence or do what you like the look of? <laughs> You're, you're looking for an efficient yow. You're looking for a yow that's going to give you a return. Every farm is different. So I stay in Huntley. What I can do in Huntley compared to what somebody could do um, in a lowland farm in the borders with Vicky would be very, very different. So it's knowing what breed suits your environment. Know what, what facilities you've got available. So have, have you got sheds? Have you got a heather hill? Have you got good grass? And it's it's looking at all those different elements and seeing exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, Vicky spoke about uniformity and having lambs batched up for the market. You know, there's nothing to stop you having two breeds if, if that's what you want to do, and then just batch them separately. Um, it's everybody's different, and it's it's what suits particular people's environments and own circumstances. Uh, we've got one from Vicky. Um, somebody's looking for you uh, to clarify, is that abattoirs will only currently take fat lambs from farm assured schemes or will they take from non-assured or ex-MV accredited farms? Do you, well, um, essentially, do you have to be farm assured, I think? No, um, the main, most of them do. And if you're not, um, the 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 options are limited of where you can go and they will also pay you less per kilo. Um, so in my opinion, it is definitely worthwhile if you have um, a reasonable number of sheep available. If you've just got a small number, then it's probably not. Um, and it depends what you're doing with them. Um, but yeah, it, it's not absolutely essential, but it is a major, a major positive um, to the abattoirs if you are. Okay, um, and following on there from, it was I think Kirsten, Kirsten mentioned it, um, through farm stock, are buyers looking for short or long keep lambs or does it, again, depends on maybe how much forage they have? 
Oh, we have all types of buyers. We have people that are looking for a quick return, um, and obviously they would be the short keep lambs. Um, but however, we also have buyers who are looking to take lambs right through until the spring. So you're looking at your smaller 25 to 30 kilo bracket. Um, so yeah, we have a full range. Um, also, um, a full range of breeds that they like to buy. Um, they, the short keep ones may want to buy Texels and Suffolk, Charolais, um, that sort of thing. And the longer keep lambs that they were look, they'll be looking for are Blackies, small Cheviots, that kind of thing. So yeah, there's a full range out there. Yeah, um, and well, final question, I'll put this one to Kirsten. Uh, is there any benefit in early lambing or lambing out of season to maybe hit a, you know, a peak in the market price? Um, or are you better lambing at a April, May time? Yeah, so this, this is something we get asked quite frequently, especially after a year. If it's a year where the early lamb prices are sky high, then people would remember that and think about what to do for next yeah. year. But there's hidden costs in that as well. You know, if you're lambing in January, you've got a long time that you're feeding your yow, you know. So if you're feeding, uh, if you're lambing in April, May, then the majority of that nutrition is coming from grass. You know, you've got good protein, good energy levels in. But if you're lambing in January, you've got a really quite a long feeding period. So you're feeding them prior to lambing and then you're feeding them post lambing as well. So there's, there's quite a lot of cost in there. And if people are going for the really early lamb market, then quite often the, the lambs are, are creep fed as well. You know, there's, there's not the grass for them to, to be growing and for the yows to be milking. So there, there is hidden costs. But that's, that's the type of one that is really good to use that partial budget, to be honest, and, and looking at um, what, what, you know, what extra costs there are, what cost savings there are. And then have discussions with people like Vicky and see, right, when is the market best? What suits what I've got? Have you got sheds to lamb them in? And there's just a whole range of different things to, to question there. Yeah. Nope. Um, no, I think that's everything. I'll pass you back to Kat now. OK, yeah, one very last question just came in there and it was who's best to speak to in farm stock about trading. Vicky, would that be yourself if anybody was interested yeah. or just going yeah. direct to the web page? Just, just give me a call and um, you'll find my details on our website. Um, give me a call anytime. If I am um, not answering, I'm probably on farm drawing laughs. So just <laughs> please leave me a voice message because, um, yeah, I, I, some, I often have to leave the car. Otherwise, I don't uh, leave the phone in the car. I don't get any work done. So please leave me a message yeah. if I don't answer. <laughs> OK, yeah, we'll, we can send out farm stock details at the end of the, the meeting tonight, folks. I'll send them out tomorrow. So that's all we have time for with regards to questions, folks. But I think that was some really good questions that came in, I have to say. Um, so thank you very much for that. If there are any additional questions tonight, guys, after you've come off the phone, you think, oh, gosh, please, by all means, mail them across to me and I can put them to Kirsten and Vicky tomorrow or later in the week and get some answers for you. Um, so all that's left tonight is to thank Kirsten and Vicky so much for their time, for you guys all for joining, uh, Malcolm, and Kirst uh, Malcolm and Kathleen for helping us out. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, folks, and thanks for joining us.